Welcome to this Sunday's worship time. I'm Lloyd Walker, one of the lay preachers here at St Luke's United in Geelong. Today, as we continue through Tom Wright's book, God and the Pandemic, we're going to be looking at the New Testament writings, the letters from Paul to, and the words of the early church. Our theme for today is groaning and serving. We've come to, to open with prayer and the time of confession, and this is based on Psalm 44. God, we recall the stories of triumph, of your love for your people, restoring good to the world. Yet during these times we are heartbroken. At times we feel rejected. Do you still hear our prayers for justice, healing and life? In these months of lockdown and anxiety, we are not sure what to say. All our Bible verses and quotes seem to ring hollow in the face of human reality we see on TV, the internet, and in our neighbours and friends' faces. O oh God, why do you sleep? Rouse yourself, don't reject us forever. Why do you hide your face and forget our misery and oppression? We are brought down to the dust, our bodies are cling to the ground. Rise up and help us, God. Rescue us because of your unfailing love. God, help us to be compassionate and faithful disciples of yours. We want simple, rational answers for what is going on. Surely someone is to blame, we say. Forgive us our arrogance, as if we should tell you, God, what you need to do. And forgive us our short memories, God, when we forget Jesus' ministry of service. We forget the Sermon on the Mount with its vision of the true kingdom of God. And we forget your call to go out into the world and be your hands and feet. Challenge us to get up and join in your transformation of the world in prayer, in action, and in love. Hear the words of assurance. Family of God, in Paul's letter to the Romans, we are reminded that the spirit you received does not make you slaves, so that we don't live in fear again. Rather, the spirit we've received has brought about adoption into God's family. And by him we cry, Daddy, Father. The spirit testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Live as God's heirs in relationship with all of creation in transforming our world. Thanks be to God. Now we're going to have uh, the gospel reading and Sue's going to bring that to us from the New Living Translation. It's been a challenge because the actual verses I wanted, um, as you'll hear as I reflect on them, are sometimes translated quite differently in the Bibles. And if you've got a New International Version, NIV, suggest you have a look at the footnote to that. It's actually got a very similar translation to Sue. This morning, our New Testament reading is from Romans, and I'm reading from the New Living Translation. Paul writes to the church in Rome to present his basic statement of the gospel, God's plan of salvation for all peoples, Jew and Gentile alike. Reading from verse 22. For we know that all creation has been groaning, as in the pains of childbirth, right up to the present time. And we believers also groan, even though we have the Holy Spirit within us, as a foretaste of future glory. For, for we long for our bodies to be released from sin and suffering. We too wait with eager hope for the day when God will give us our full rights as his adopted children, including the new bodies he has promised us. We were given this hope when we were saved. If we already have something, we don't need to hope for it. But if we look forward to something we don't yet have, we must wait patiently and confidently. And the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. For example, we don't know what God wants us to pray for, 
but the Holy Spirit prays for us with groanings that cannot be expressed in words. And the Father who knows all hearts knows what the Spirit is saying, for the Spirit pleads for us believers in harmony with God's own will. And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. For God knew his people in advance and he chose them to become like his son so that his son would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And having chosen them, he called them to come to him. And having called them, he gave them right standing with himself. And having given them right standing, he gave them his glory. So let's reflect on those words. Try and understand what's going on. In times of trauma, humans, or is it maybe just Western civilizations, I don't know, tend to look back with nostalgia to the good old days. But apart from clean air, there wasn't much that was good about life for the ordinary folk in the early church. The coming of God's kingdom through the death and resurrection of Jesus was not like the fairy tale spell, where suddenly all the baddies realise their error. Peace and love spread throughout the land. Birds sing joyous songs and all are happy and fed. No, it wasn't like that. In fact, in Acts, we see people tortured and abused, killed and thrown out because they continue to do what Jesus told them to do. And then in Acts 11, we are reminded that there was a great famine foretold. And the response is not, well, that'll teach them, or, well, what have we done to deserve this? Or, let's put out a new sermon series on how sinning leads to starvation. No. As Tom Wright describes it, their response is a pragmatic one, a gift of love, even to people of a different race or ethnicity in another province. Their response is, who is at special risk? In this case, it was the suppressed Christians who were living still in Jerusalem. What can we do to help? And who shall we send? Now, our reading from Romans 8 today contains a challenge that has perhaps been hidden Many translations have verse 28 as, We know that all things work together for good for those who love God, who are called according to his purpose. And we like it that way. In our rationalist thinking, and I don't know, we probably think it like this. I don't know why or what's going on, but that's okay. God has it all sorted out and this must be part of God's plan. I find it ironic, after all my life's experience, that I've even bought that line. When I know how painful those words are, when life's tragedies strike, and well-meaning Christians offer those verses, almost as a throwaway line. But thankfully, biblical scholars have continued to test this text and ask what does it actually say? This is about reading the Bible to teach us, not reading back into the Bible what we'd like it to say. The footnote, as I said in the NIV, gives us a better ver way of describing it. We know that in all things God works together with those who love him to bring about what is good, with those who have been called according to his purpose. So the times we're living in and the pain and trauma that we and our world are experiencing through COVID, climate change, social and legal injustices, is not the end times. It isn't a cause to berate our neighbours and Facebook friends that, see, this is what comes from sin, or God is punishing us because. That suggests we want to stand on the sidelines and throw rocks in the belief that somehow God will just come and smote those bad things and make it right. That's early James and John theology. Think, you know, James and John, brothers of Sons of Thunder, who saw Jesus as the world conqueror and wanted to be his lieutenants. The disciples and the early church learned that Jesus' kingdom was one transformed by acts of kindness, compassion, prayer, and care for the suffering 
selling all and giving it away to reduce inequality. Actions lived out. At the heart of God's kingdom movement is acts of being the servant, washing feet, being willing to tend the wounds to those suffering from leprosy, standing in front of the bulldozers about to destroy occupied shanty homes in the name of progress, welcoming homeless people into our dwellings. I could go on. This is what is transforming our world. Remember my comment earlier about the spells from the fairy tales? In fact, the growth of the Kingdom of God is a bit like the movies where the heroes push the button and either nothing seems to happen or it seems like a little pop. And as their enemies start to gloat and laugh that it didn't work, <laughs> then there comes a rumbling. And then suddenly, bang, everything is changed. Baddies are washed away, overturned. It's all different. Friends, we are in the rumbling phase. Jesus' death and resurrection was when the button was pushed. We need to keep on doing what God called us to do, to look after the suffering, struggling in the current ways of the world until that kingdom transformation whoosh fully arrives and all is made new. And above all, we must pray. And take to heart Romans 8. Even when we don't know what to pray, the world doesn't make sense. We should be in prayer, groaning with God, trusting in God's authority we see in the last verses of Romans chapter 8. And in doing so, we join with God in transforming the world, being the little thunderbolts from God, undermining the powers of the world through love and bringing the new heaven and new earth we read about in Revelations 21 into being. Amen. If you've been reading the book by Tom, Tom Wright, you will know that he mentions a song in there. And the song is called, Great God, Your Love Has Called Us Here. And my thanks go out to Val McKenzie and Jenny Patchett for helping me um, prepare this song. And so they're going to share it with you now. And we've put the words on the screen. So please join in and sing through. Are you ready? Set us free, your love. 
During this challenging year, our prayers have rightly been for those whose lives and livelihoods have been so impacted by the global virus pandemic. And we must keep offering these prayers. But today, I'm going to offer a prayer for us, the praying people of faith. Please join me. Let us pray. We thank you, Father, for the gift of faith that you have given each of us. Faith in Jesus as Saviour, as Lord, as Sustainer, as Empower, and the access we have to you through his indwelling Spirit. This morning we are asking you to give us faith for fresh action, to expect hope even when feeling hopeless, to express joy even when sensing despair, to offer love, even when tempted to be annoyed, to speak healing, even from our own brokenness. By the power of the risen Christ within, Father, please help us to act as cheerleaders and encouragers, to mentor and counsel and guide, to sympathize and empathize, to share the load with those whose burdens are heavy, so that those who might be mourning, who might be celebrating an anniversary alone, who might be in medical or financial stress, who might be struggling to keep their household together and calm, they will be comforted, encouraged, and see their need met through the ministry of the Spirit of the saving, healing Christ. We ask this confidently in Jesus' name. Amen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. And now for the blessing and the going out. Go from this time, not to understand all the challenges of the world. Instead, trust God with those cares. Go to pray without ceasing, groaning with the Spirit when the words are beyond you. Go to live your calling as children, heirs of God, followers of the servant King Jesus, and engage the world as Jesus did, with love, compassion, and hope, and transformation. And the empowering grace of Christ Jesus, the overflowing love of God, the embrace of the Spirit, rest with you now and always.